You are listening to listening www.integralnaked.org. In the marriage of sense and soul, you said there's a philosophical cold war between science and religion. Do you see them as fundamentally in conflict? Well, personally, I don't. And that's one of the things that I am trying to convey in, you know, a number of books and stuff that we're doing at Integral Institute. The problem, of course, depends entirely on what you mean by science or what you mean by religion. And part of what I think I've done, if I've contributed anything to this, is attempt to tease apart the different definitions of science and religion. What do you mean? If you don't know what you mean by science, you don't know what you mean by religion, then you really don't know what you mean by science or religion. Hmm. Well, I, l- 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 I'm sure we'll get to the definitions <laughs> as, as we go along, but a lot of people would say that science over the last few centuries has steadily dismantled the myths of religion, and by now it has basically replaced religion as a way of understanding the world. How do you respond to that argument? Well, there are at a minimum two types of religion. And one is indeed a kind of a mythic dogma, a kind of magic mythic approach. And that is certainly what most people mean by religion. It's the most prevalent. It's the most obvious. It's the most common. But virtually all of the great traditions themselves recognize the difference between what they would call exoteric outer religion and esoteric inner religion. And the inner religion aspect tends to be, and certainly the way I would use it, contemplative or meditative technologies. They're actually psychotechnologies. They're ways of introspecting, working with the mind, and disciplining the body-mind. And if you look at those, it's an entirely different story, a very, very different story. Science has pretty thoroughly dismantled the mythic dogmatic religions. I think no question about it. There's very little of those that remain. But in terms of the contemplative traditions, science is actually very, very sympathetic with those in terms of its actual methodology. Hmm. And we can go into that if you want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let's just let's talk about this history a little bit because yeah. there's no denying that science has been extremely successful at explaining the material world and, and the whole Enlightenment project, rejecting yeah. the church as the dominant intellectual and moral authority, opened up all kinds of positive developments of democracy, human rights, oh, yeah. not to mention modern science. Oh, yeah. Where did the scientific worldview go wrong? At what point did it overreach? Well, one of the ways that we can look at it, if we just stick again with the two types of religion, which for the moment I'll just call mythic or dogmatic on the one hand, and then meditative technology or or, or contemplative technologies on the other, is that the mythic approaches tend to be pre-rational, they're pre-verbal, they're pre-conventional, and so on. But aspects of the contemplative approaches tend to be transrational. They completely accept rationality. They completely accept science as far as it goes. But they point out that there are higher or deeper modes of awareness that are in their own way scientific. And what conventional science has done is correctly work with dismantling the pre-rational myths, but incorrectly going too far and dismantling the transrational because they can't tell the difference between pre and trans. When you talk about pre-rational myths, I mean, you're talking about most of the stories we would read in the Bible, for you instance. Bet. Or any of the world's guys. I mean, Lao Tzu was 900 years old when he was born, and according to the Hindus, the earth is resting on a, you know, a serpent, which is resting on an elephant, which is resting on a turtle, and, and it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, those kind of mythic, dogmatic approaches, in the way I look at them using developmental approach, those mythic approaches aren't wrong. They're a stage of development, and if we look at Gene Gebser's structural stages of development, they go from archaic to magic to mythic to rational to pluralistic to integral and higher. And the magic and mythic are actual stages, and it's not right to call those incorrect or wrong any more than we would say, you know, five years old is wrong. Hmm. It's just, it's five years old, Hmm. and we expect there to be higher stages. And so there was a time when the magic and mythic approaches about two, 3,000 years ago, were leading edge. They were evolution's leading edge of development, and so we can't belittle them in that sense. And they remain a stage in child development today. So what do you mean by transrational, then? Well, that's when, if we actually do just a straight scientific study of these stages of development, by scientific I mean we use empirical investigation, we use empirical research of the stages that people are at, and we ask them questions, we do research, and so on, and that's basically what the developmentalists do. 
And whether we're talking about Piaget or Lovinger or Colbert or Arietti or Graves, any of these kinds of folks. And so their approach in that sense is scientific. And if you actually look at those stages, and I'll use the Gene Gepser since I mentioned them, that goes from magic to mythic to rational to pluralistic to integral and transpersonal. What we find is that at the integral and transpersonal stages, those are what we're referring to as transrational. And it's just this is based on the actual research itself. And what we find at those stages are things that do sound spiritual but not mythic. And by spiritual, I mean at these higher stages, people report a type of non-dual awareness, an awareness that transcends subject and object dichotomy and fragmentation, awareness that if anything is sort of super conscious, not pre-conscious or subconscious, is fully aware of autonomy and rationality and so on, but also finds higher and wider modes of awareness that are much more integral and integrating. And so those are, if we use rationality as a reference point, those are transrational or transformal. Again, they transcend and include rationality. They do not deny it. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question is, why has the scientific worldview just so completely dismissed this whole transpersonal dimension that you're talking about. I mean, this is, I mean, among intellectuals in, in the oh, world yeah. today, I mean, for instance, the, the secular scientific paradigm has basically won out. Yeah, yeah. If you look at it, it's certainly understandable, and I actually support it to some degree. Historically, what we find is if you look at these just broad stages or waves of development that go from archaic to magic to mythic to rational, let's stop at rational right now, because that's where the center of gravity of uh, leading edge evolution is. And if we look at that, indeed, the magical era tended to be around 50,000 years ago, and then the mythic era tended to emerge around 5,000 B.C., and then the rational era, rational secular humanism, tended to emerge, of course, with the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And as far as those stages go, that's fine. We don't deny those stages. It's just if you keep looking at development, we see two or three more stages. And those are the ones that we're going to call transpersonal for the moment. And the actual gains that science made in moving beyond magic and mythic, moving beyond five years old, is extremely important and was hard fought. The whole Enlightenment was basically an attempt to liberate myth and base truth claims on evidence. Now, is, this, really is, dogma. is this partly because the, for the Enlightenment to succeed, it, it had to reject the authority of the Church? I think that's part of it. And what happens is because these two different types of religion, we're calling mythic and meditative, were bundled in the same package generally. I mean, if you look at the meditative strands of Catholicism, for example, you find an interior phenomenology, a very profound phenomenology of consciousness. You find this in things like St. John of the Cross, uh, St. Teresa, any of the mystics or sages that worked with interior development, which are relatively rare, relatively much less than 1%. And they were not always looked upon kindly by the church. I mean, even though these were, exactly right. these, these were the, you know, in, in many people's eyes today, exemplary figures, these, these medieval mystics, but they were also pretty threatening, weren't they? Very much so, and for just that reason. They also had moved quite beyond those stages, and most of the great contemplative mystics were always in danger, frankly, of getting, you know, burned or hung. Huh. So it was always walking a very, very fine line. Meister Eckhart had his theses condemned. Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake. Uh, it's kind of a common story. And so what these contemplative traditions were trying to do is accept archaic, magic, mythic, rational, and then move into the integral and transpersonal stages. And instantly we have evidence for these stages of development now. In other words, if you go to developmentalists who are looking at overall stages of development, and you look at Jane Lovinger and her work extended by Suzanne Kukreuter, or if you look at Claire Graves and his work extended by Jenny Wade, what you find is indeed a variation on the same story. The human development, starting at birth, goes from archaic around the first year of life to magic around one to three years to mythic starting around five and going to around eight or nine, then the emergence of rationality in adolescence. Pluralism tends to emerge in late adolescence and early adulthood, and then the integral and transpersonal as stable stages, not temporary states, can emerge in later adulthood. So we have evidence, uh, again, quote, scientific evidence for these higher stages. 
It's just they're very, very rare, less than 1%, because the higher you go in development, the fewer individuals are there. And what happened, because they were bundled into the church, even though, again, the church was on very, very tentative terms with these folks, when science threw out the church, it threw the whole baby out with the bathwater. Classic, classic case of baby out with the bathwater. And so, of course, what we want to do, ideally, we have contemplative sciences, these interior phenomenologies, united with conventional exterior sciences, and the two of those together would be a very interesting way to get a, a little fuller picture of reality. And that's mm-hmm. certainly one of the things that we're recommending. So what you're saying then is culturally we're kind of stuck in, what, the the adolescent phase? <laughs> you know, but before you get to yeah, the transpersonal yeah. stuff? Basically, young adolescent, young adulthood. And there's a whole kind of adolescent fervor to the Enlightenment anyway, I think, to the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. It almost just kind of looking at it intuitively, it sort of feels that way. Uh, the discovery of rationality, formal operational cognition, was an extraordinary breakthrough compared to the previous stage of concrete operational or mythic literal cognition. And so it was an extraordinary advance, and I've, I stand fully behind that. I, mean, I did my graduate studies in biochemistry, mm-hmm. so I, I'm totally behind that. It's just in the 60s, we actually saw the emergence of the pluralistic stage and sometimes called the relativistic stage by some researchers. And what we find there really is moving into, you know, young adulthood and even middle adulthood. And therefore, there's a much more almost confusion. The pluralistic stage is very much like postmodernism and multiculturalism. It sees a multitude of truths, unlike sort of a simpler science, rational science. And it sees so many multitude of truths that can get confused. And it almost doesn't know where to go. All truth starts to look relative and so on. And we can discuss that, but that tends to be the pluralistic stage. And that's about where the leading edge is. That's about the farthest that it's gone. We see about 20% of the population, incidentally, is at that pluralistic stage. And then if you go to the next stage, the integral stage, less than 2%. Hmm. You mentioned your science background, and uh-huh. I want to ask you a little bit about that. You were a budding scientist at one point. I, I've read that in high school you built chemistry labs yeah. in your basement. You won science prizes at yeah. fairs, and, and you went on to be a graduate student in biochemistry. Yeah. Why did you decide to leave that scientific track to, to study the soul and the spirit? Sure. Well, what happened was, I, indeed, I went to Duke University in the medical track, and then decided that I really wanted to do something which I thought would be a little bit more creative in terms of research. So I switched to biochemistry at Nebraska and did work in biophysics and biochemistry. And that's basically my fundamental degrees. But I have had scientific orientation. I think I was born a scientist. And indeed, early chemistry labs, almost any scientist knows this. You know, all the early experiments and the frogs you cut up and the, the disastrous things, the explosions in the basement and all that kind of stuff. And then what started to happen is I moved into my young adulthood and mere rationality didn't really seem to be answering the questions that were arising at that stage in my life. And they really do start to turn into, you know, why am I here? What's it all about? What's the nature of reality? And so on. Now, is this because you had been reading, I don't know, certain great mystics or what what turned for you? Well, I think it was both, but I think because these stages are real, I think that when individuals grow or develop into these stages, that's how you look at the world. You actually, that is a constant pressure in your awareness, in your consciousness. And in this case, I wanted to know the answers to this. I realized science, although I had a profound appreciation for it, that kind of exterior science anyway just wasn't working. Now, I turned to Zen Buddhism originally because to me it was very scientific. If you actually look at, you know, what is science, and God knows there's thousands of books written on that, and there's no real agreement as to what the actual scientific method is, but you and I know it. It's like pornography. We, we know enough about it. We know <laughs> right. we see it. And for me, it had three strands, and I've also written about this, but the three strands of science, you actually look at any sort of just straight-out science, the three strands are an injunction. If you want to know this, do this. I want to know if it's raining outside, walk to the window. I want to know if a cell has a nucleus, get a microscope, stain it, look at the cell. These injunctions are also actually the meaning of Thomas Kuhn's paradigm. Paradigm and an exemplar, an actual practice that you engage in. So it's some sort of practice or activity. You do this. It's, a, it's an actual experiment. And if you do that experiment, you'll get some sort of evidence. You'll have some sort of experience. you have some sort of data. And William James defined data as, you know, an experience. And so there's an injunction or an experiment, and then there's evidence or data, experience, direct experience. 
not you know a myth or anything, right. but direct experience. And then the third strand is some sort of checking. You, you check it with other people to make sure you haven't goofed up. And there are several broad schools of that. And one of the more famous ones, of course, is Sir Karl Popper's, which is you try to disprove it. But in any event, some sort of consensual evidence is required. And so those three strands are exactly what I was doing in Zen Buddhism. Hmm. There's an actual experiment. You have to do this. You have to train your mind. And this mind training is... Well, frankly, it's more difficult than anything I did in graduate school. <laughs> but um, I mean, that, let me let me follow up on that. Yeah. The third stage that you were talking about, oh, Carl, sure, sure. Karl Popper's objection that you know, if you can't disprove something, then it's not science. Right? Can you disprove the meditation? I mean, is that, I mean, I guess I'm wondering how far you can take that scientific analogy well, when, when you're talking far, about a contemplative practice. Well, pretty far, I think. And one of the reasons is. If you look at these schools, I'm probably pushing at this point to call them, you know, uh, meditative sciences because we haven't agreed that, that they are science. So I just call them meditative uh, techniques or disciplines. They've been passed down for hundreds of years and sometimes a thousand years or so. And the only way you can do that is it has to be public knowledge if you're going to train it. Much like judo or something like that, there are actual techniques that you can learn and pass this on. Also, like learning mathematics. Mathematics is an interior thing that you do in your mind. You don't see equations running out there in the exterior world. You have to train your mind to see these symbols. If I continue using Zen as an example, what happens is you have an injunction, which is called Zazen. You have to sit and train the mind. To begin with, you have to be able to count your breath without losing count for upwards of an hour. You have to be able to concentrate on an object for at least five minutes, often much more, but at least five minutes without losing track. The average adult American can do it for 18 seconds. Hmm. So the first strand is an injunction. The second strand, the data there, is called Satori. You look in your mind stream, once you've trained it, and you look and you investigate your interior consciousness and its actual nature, its structure, and it is claimed that if you do this intensely enough, you get a profound aha experience, a profound satori, a profound awakening. And then that satori or experience is then checked with others who have completed the paradigm or who have actually followed the exemplar or the injunction. You're not allowed to vote on this if you haven't actually done the practice. So, like, you're not allowed to vote on the truth of the Pythagorean theorem if mm -hmm. you don't learn geometry. So you actually do the practice, and then you check it with others who have done it. But I'm guessing that most scientists <laughs> would not accept that as proof of this as science. I mean, because ultimately you're left to people describing their own experiences. Yes. I mean, you, can, you can't measure this with any conventional scientific instruments. You move in the realm of what's called phenomenology. And you're of the mindset that you either allow phenomenology or you don't. You either say, okay, we can investigate interior phenomena. And this applies to anything like psychoanalysis, same stuff, same complaints are brought against that. It's not real science. It's not real. You can't prove it. Well, fine. I mean, if that's so, you can't prove any interior experience you're having. So you can't prove you love your wife. You can't prove that you're happy. You can't prove that you have an insight. You forget all of that. It's not real. And if that's the mindset you have, nobody's going to convince you otherwise. And that's certainly the, the case here. It really comes down to whether there are things called the guy sciences, the interior sciences. And you either sort of believe it or you don't. Now, the difference is these interior sciences, if they are that, use the same three injunctions as the exterior sciences. But the interior sciences are based on looking at interior phenomena, and the exterior sciences are based on looking at exterior phenomena or, or something that can be seen with the senses or its five extensions. If you define science as based on sensory experience, then these interior endeavors are not science. If you define science as based on experience, then these interior ones are. Mm -hmm. So it's just how you slice that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of experiential evidence, there's sensory experience, there's mental experience, and there's spiritual experience. What about uh, brain imaging studies? There are various yep. neuroscientists out there who are hooking up Buddhist meditators and Christian nuns to... Yeah, Richie to, Davidson. Right, brain scanning technology. And, and they definitely can see changes in brain activity yeah. during meditation or prayer. Are these important studies? I mean, can they tell us anything fundamental about the nature of consciousness? Well, yes and no. What happens is that they're clearly showing something happening. And in that sense, if somebody gets into a particular meditative state, they're showing particular kinds of brainwave activity. 
that doesn't prove anything for me. I'll play my own devil's advocate. That really doesn't prove anything. It proves that you have a different brain state. It doesn't prove that it's better or that it's more real or that you're having a Satori, seeing a higher reality or anything like that at all. It proves that your brain changed. And so that's important. But for somebody who really is not going to allow interior phenomenology, who just will not allow that science can be based on experience and not just sensory experience, that person's not going to be convinced of anything. I haven't really found any good arguments that will convince them of that. Mm-hmm. Except to point out that logic and mathematics also fit that bill. You can't prove logic, you can't prove mathematics, because they're interior. Hmm. So it's those kinds of things, and the person seems to be ready to accept it or not. I have a really unfair argument, which I'll just mention you know, to you as long as you don't tell anybody. <laughs> and that is that somebody at that rational stage of development almost never will accept interior experience. Hmm. When you get to the pluralistic and then the integral, and particularly the transpersonal stages, those three higher stages, they almost always do accept it. Hmm. So we are in part, we might be faced with just that, that certain stages of development are predisposed to deny interior sciences, and certain stages are are open to it. Now let me mention one thing really quickly, Mm -hmm. because we see this pre-trans problem, that pluralistic and integral stages would allow some of these interior experiences. You have to look at them in a trans-rational way. Remember that pre-rational stages, magic and myth, also believe all sorts of stuff that's really nonsense. They, interior things and fairies and ghosts and goblins and et cetera, et cetera. And the rational scientist looks at all that pre-rational stuff and can't tell the difference from the trans-rational stuff, lumps them all together and says, oh, that's non-rational. I don't want anything to do with it. Not understanding that there's a difference between pre-rational and Mm post-rational, pre-rational and Mm trans-rational. So that's another thing. We just have to keep that in mind if we're going to be open-minded about looking at what constitutes science and what doesn't. Yeah. Getting back to technology, would a brain scan of a profound mystical experience, I don't know, if if Meister Eckhart or Teresa of Avila could have been hooked up to a brain scanning device, uh, would that reveal anything important, do you think? Well, I do. I think that if we look at the actual brain structures and states themselves, that states of consciousness have corresponding states of physiology. And so if you're in a distinctive state of consciousness, which we're for the moment saying that these individuals would be, and we just call it Satori, then that would have, leave a distinctive fingerprint, a unique fingerprint in the brain. And then if another person trains and claims, looking interiorly, claims that they are in that state, and then you hook them up to a brain machine, and it is the same state, that adds evidence to suggest that the interior claims have some sort of validity. Mm -hmm. So this is probably something that we have not yet seen in a laboratory. I mean, we've certainly seen the meditators, but that's not necessarily one of these life-changing experiences. I mean, I'm I'm assuming that's never actually been recorded in a scientific lab. What's starting to show up, though, are significant and unique fingerprints of some of these meditative states. For example, it's been demonstrated that individuals that do a type of meditation that is said to increase compassion, and it's basically imagining another person or knowing somebody who's in pain, and you breathe in their pain, and and you, you really try to empathize and so on. But it also really does involve some of these states that are felt to be transpersonal, where there's a feeling of oneness with that person. They start showing distinctive gamma wave patterns. And they're very, very distinctive. They almost show up no place else. And the claim that these meditators make, which is that they're entering a specific interior state, has a need some kind of evidence, at least on brain states. But let me just point out what it doesn't prove, playing my own devil's advocate. Remember that the claim of the aha experiences or the satori experiences is that they are showing a deeper and wider reality than the rational and the pre-rational stages. Mm -hmm. And that claim that it's a higher state can only be made if you're interiorly looking at it. And an example would be, we say that waking is more real than dreaming. If I have a dream and 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 in it, I can't tell. I think the dream is real when I'm in it. If I wake up, I will make a judgment and I will say, wait a minute, waking is real state. The dream state is not real. But the brain waves won't tell you that. You look at brain waves and it's a delta pattern in sleep and let's say an alpha pattern when you're awake, but it doesn't say, therefore, delta is unreal. 
see, you can't tell the kinds of judgments that these interior states make by looking at exterior brainwaves. Well, brain the brainwaves are just different. You and, can't say one is more real than another. Well, and the other way to look at it is that even if you have one of these profound mystical experiences, it's just, you know, the cause of a bunch of neurons That's right. firing in some way. And, I mean, does it, you know, you could be crazy and, and yeah. have this experience. <laughs> yes, they could be training in, in a type of schizophrenia. That's the problem. Again, the brain states are suggestive, but in terms of the actual claims, the spiritual claims, they prove exactly nothing. Hmm. Well, this raises a fundamental question about the whole mind-brain question because, I mean, I'm guessing that virtually all neuroscientists would say the mind is nothing but the product of those electrochemical surges in the brain. Essentially, our consciousness is nothing more than the neural circuitry of our brains. What's wrong with that view, in your opinion? Well, it reduces everything. I mean, if that's the case, then your statement itself and your awareness is nothing but neurochemical fireworks. And you can make no distinctions of value. There is no such thing as, you know, love is better than hate or a moral impulse is better than an immoral impulse or loving my wife is better than hating my wife. And all those value distinctions are erased. Right. You, you, you can't make the value distinctions, but is there still anything to say that that scientific view is wrong? Well, other than it, it contradicts itself. I mean, it's basically saying that some views are right and some views are wrong, but if everything's material atoms, they're all just equally the same. You can't make even that kind of judgment. It's a contradiction. And at this point, of course, you enter the philosophy of science, and the argument is endless. Is there nothing but physical stuff in the universe, or is there some sort of interiority? We're not talking about ghosts and goblins and souls and all that kind of stuff. Just is there interiority? Is there an inside to the universe? And if there is interiority as there is exteriority, then that interiority is where consciousness resides and where values reside. And you can't see that, but it's real. And this is the claim that phenomenology makes. So, for example, you and I are attempting to reach mutual understanding right now. Mm -hmm. And we say, ah, I understand what you're saying. Ah, You can't point to that mutual understanding. Where does it exist? And so if we take a phenomenology of our interior states then what phenomenology says, and phenomenology, of course, is a Western science. I mean, it was developed as a science of interiority. And you either, again, believe it or you don't, but the claim is that you do what's called bracketing. You bracket any empirical claims of the interior states, and you simply describe them as they are. You look at them as being real in themselves. And that whole phenomenology is where values lie and meaning lies and all of these things that we're talking about if you try to reduce those to matter then basically not only do you lose all of those distinctions you can't even make the claim that some of them are right and some of them are wrong so you can't actually even reduce them to matter if you try to do it but i guess the question is somewhere down the road 50 years 100 years 500 years once neuroscience has become much more advanced will scientists be able to pinpoint where these various values come from or these thoughts i mean will science ever be able to describe the kinds of values that you're talking about or are you saying that brain science will never ever understand this I'm saying we'll never understand it, because what happens, in my opinion, is you have this interiority and exteriority, and they rise together. And there has been constant attempts to reduce one to the other for the last 2,000 years. Remember, the most prevalent attempt has been to reduce brain to mind. In other words, the idealistic approaches in Western philosophy are much, much more prevalent than the materialistic reductionist approaches. But both of them won't give up. I mean, it's been 2,000 years, really, since this thing started seriously, and both sides are swearing that tomorrow they're going to get the final thing to prove it. The materialists keep issuing promissory notes, and they've never done it yet. They have never done it yet. They always promise they're going to do it tomorrow. And what we do with the integral approach is we say, just stop it. Hmm. Both are real. Interior and exterior arise together. You cannot reduce one to the other. They're both real. Wherever there's an inside, there's an outside. Deal with it. And you just can't do that. So it's called a non-dual approach or an integral approach, and it takes phenomenology as real, and it takes material science as real, but it says where phenomenology tries to deny material science, don't listen to it, and where material science tries to deny interiority and phenomenology, don't listen to it. You are listening to www.integralnaked.org. 